Some argue Tesla has a huge advantage in self-driving and autonomy. Some argue they're so far behind, but one thing is undeniable. Without training data, AI will never learn to drive. And the question we're going to address today is where will the competition get their driving data? I'm Brian. Welcome to Futuraza. <laughs> So I've got John back with us for uh, another round of insights. Uh, John is a, a software guy. I don't know what the title you'd like to go with is. Um, I just know that anyone who works in any way with computers gets all kinds of questions. Can you help me with my router? Um, and the answer is no. I can, but I will not. <laughs> so <laughs> that's I have enough trouble keeping my own stuff running. Yeah, now my official title is Software Dinosaur. So. Oh. Good, good. Because I, I, I first started uh, getting on for 40 years ago. So uh, all this newfangled stuff, it's fascinating, but I learned I learned Pascal mm. at one point. So that that served me well. <laughs> and that's most of my career. So there we go. <laughs> Is serving me well. And I appreciate that, yes. John. That's what we're here for. Yep. So let's start with the obvious. We know where Tesla gets their training data. They've got a very complicated set of sensor input. They've got cameras all the way around on some vehicles they have in the past had radar and ultrasonics. Um, and, but in addition to just cameras, they've got accelerometers, they've got all kinds of uh, other ways of measuring what's going on, including the weather, including outside factors uh, like uh, wind speed. If you've ever used the graph in your Tesla to see how you're doing in terms of efficiency on your particular journey, you will say, you will see on the screen, it says you uh, lost 0.1% on this journey because of a headwind from the Northwest at 0.5, you know, whatever, four miles an hour. So they've got a lot of data that they're able to put together. Waymo, how do they collect data? Well, they don't very much because <laughs> uh, they've only got a few thousand, I don't know how many, it's not many at all, is it? And the no. main issue they have that we hear various people talking about is that those cars cost a huge amount of money. So to scale, they're going to co it would cost them billions. So it's challenging to understand how they really collect any meaningful data beyond basic. So how would they swap to the, the latest model we've seen in FSD where it's actually training off video, not and they're at, without heuristics? The other guys have got to rely on heuristics. So it's possible they'll never make that step up to, to the version that we've just seen with version 12 of FSD. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the approach that companies like Cruise and Waymo took was let's put all the sensors that we can possibly think of on a car yeah. and pay a human monkey to drive around and just cover every street as many times as possible. And that is a very inefficient way to do something. I, I can't think of a much less efficient, I, I, really, it's just terrible. I was going to say a really fundamental difference we see with Waymo is we don't see them going very fast. And they they really do not take the highway. There's a really important reason for that. If, the, if you're working on the heuristics, you can stop quickly if something gets in the way, if you're doing 30 miles an hour which you can't do if you're doing 60 or even 80 on the highway. So you need to have a much more fundamental understanding if you're going faster of everything that's happening around you, even to some distance, to map the trajectories of all the other vehicles. Whereas if you're going 30 miles an hour, you need a much simpler model to survive, which simply says, as long as there's nothing within a reasonable distance from me, which I wouldn't be able to stop if I had to stop quickly, then I, I can survive with a very simple model. Uh, somebody walks across the road in front of me, 100 yards away, that's safe. That wouldn't be safe if somebody walked across the highway in front of you when you're doing 80. So it's mm -hmm. going to be a very, very different model. Last summer, Ryan from the Kilowatts did a fantastic race with a whole Mars catalog and another gentleman whose name I keep forgetting. Were in San Francisco. They did the same path with a Cruise, a Waymo, and a Tesla to race out to the Presidio to see who would win. And the first thing the Tesla did was hop on the highway and yeah. Cruz and Waymo did not. You're going to have a disadvantage if you cannot take the quickest path. And I've always wondered why that is that they've got these such sophisticated systems, but they can only do surface streets. And your answer makes sense. So let's say I'm Apple 
and it is not today, but a couple weeks ago, when I still have a self-driving car program, I know that I need the data. Where could I possibly get it? Apart from buying it from someone like Tesla, and I don't mean someone like Tesla, I mean Tesla, where on earth would Apple get enough training data? Where could Ford get enough training data? Well, that's a difficult question. And I think the answer is they can't. Uh, I, I think it is. I think in the, the short answer. term, I mean, longer term, perhaps Ford could put cameras in millions of cars. Yes. But we're talking a new model of car in several years, then start to collect the data. We're looking at at least seven or eight years before they start to collect data. Well, I mean, it's too late. It's all finished. It's all finished by then. So you could do that. Ford could say, we're going to put eight cameras and maybe some other sensors on every single car at a cost. Cameras are cheap. Wiring is the the cost of getting the wires to the cameras is going to be more than the cost of the cameras. But then you need the chipset, which is the biggest cost. Then you need the data connection to actually have access to that data. And then because it's not doing anything, it doesn't provide any benefit for the buyer, you got to get their permission. And a lot of people would opt out of, wait, so it's just going to use extra energy in my car at for no bet? No, no, you can pay me for that, but you, I'm not doing it for free. Ford, I don't think, has the margin to put that hardware on a car and pay for it without losing money. Now, Ford is recently, at least, quite profitable, but take that cost, $1,000, $2,000, and then take all the back-end cost of collecting it and making sense of it, even if Ford or GM or any of the big dogs decided we're going to do, you know what, we sell more cars. We could gather data five times faster. But like you said, five times faster starting when? Yes, and of course, you need the software to process the data. Because if you've got eight cameras, you need to merge them all into one image. And Tesla have got an advantage in almost every way you can imagine. As we heard maybe a year ago, they've rewritten the low-level driver for the cameras. Because up to that point, everybody processes the images that are coming through to make them nicer for people to look at. But what they've actually done is throw away information that was quite subtle. And as they said, they can literally pick up a few photons. So very subtle changes in the image can be processed by Tesla, but everybody else has just thrown that information away. With all these cameras around there, uh, around everywhere, I'm surprised we still haven't found Sasquatch. Surely Nessie's got to be in one of these parks somewhere. The cameras should be able to detect Nessie and Sasquatch and of course ghosts. You don't see as many ghost sightings now that people used to see ghosts all the time. But now that you've got a phone in your hand and your mind is occupied, your brain doesn't wander. Or my theory, the ghost is actually looking at the phone with you. They're not bored. I think that's it's funny. Uh, you should funny you should talk about ghosts. Can we talk about ghosts for a minute? You know what? Let's talk about ghosts for a minute. So with eight cameras, an obvious benefit is that it's looking everywhere all at once. So when we look at FSD, we can actually talk about there's two distinct aspects. And of course, it's inherently better than a person who's only looking in roughly one direction, but a little broad. But you can't, we can't look in both directions at the same time. If you're at a junction with fast traffic in both directions, you have to look both ways quite quickly, as fast as you can to try and judge it. But at the very last second, you're looking to the left and a car begins to emerge on the right that you don't see. Now, the training, when they're doing this in the training center, what they can do is they can actually say, five seconds after that human made a decision, was there a car close? We now know that that example was a bad example, even if the human didn't actually see the car at the time. So it's almost as if they can see backwards in time. And getting onto ghosts, let's imagine that fast road has got, a, it, let's say it's an intersection with cars coming in the other direction as well. There's a car over there on the other side. It's not moving, it's not going in our direction. It's going to turn, I'll get confused now, left on drive, right on drive. It's turning right in your world. So it's not coming anywhere near us uh, on our side. So I'm looking in both directions. We notice that five seconds later, after I pulled out, 
there was a car that was quite close which it would have been better not to pull out but the human didn't see it but actually in some cases it might not have been visible in either direction but remember we talked about photons a minute ago we can't look in every direction but fsd might spot a reflection or a ghost of that car in the car across the other side we only need a few photons a few photons flashing across that image we're going to train on all that data and it's going to spot patterns another example might be a stop sign that's completely covered mm -hmm. fsd might spot that the tree has grown around something which might be a sign and i should therefore slow down so it can look at so many different possibilities in the longer term so what we've got is fsd has got two aspects it's going to be absolutely superhuman at spotting patterns that humans can't because we just can't process enough information fast enough the other side of fsd is it's not been trained on enough cases yet and does really stupid things but that's more of the planning side and that's where we see that it still needs to make more work it needs to be which saw a video today of it going straight through a red light on uh, what do you call these things as you go onto the highway on ramp uh, oh the meter. the on ramp the meter ramp yes never heard of that before today but uh, <laughs> it hadn't been trained on yet but of course they'll pick up some more videos they'll find examples and teslas are actually finding and reporting every case where the human intervenes hmm. what's going on there oh and then they'll look at the videos yeah great training example we'll put that in and then suddenly it'll know how to handle those so looking at apple uh, i don't know where they would have gotten their training data because they don't own cars they could hmm. partner with someone i guess but again that would take two to three to five years just to get them into cars. Apple would, I assume, have had the capacity to be ready for the data when it arrived so they could make sense of it. But still getting it in, recognized, trained, we're still talking 10 years out. Uh, apart from the Chinese companies, which have, in many cases, their own cars and their own sensors and their own programs, that's a whole different world. I'm looking at the companies we know that we can follow closely in the West because our Ecosystems of information are, are still pretty siloed between the two continents, uh, mm. not accidentally. And, but there are companies like Apple. What are they? Are they going to pay? What would they? I mean, what would you even pay someone like Ford to say, we're going to put the stuff on your cars and and take the data? They'd have to pay for all the hardware, thousand, two thousand a car. They'd have to they'd have to pay for the engineering and then they'd have to pay for the data itself, because I'm not just going to give you all this resource for nothing. So, and they're going to have to build their own data center with their own training. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. But there's another really huge advantage that Tesla have. Imagine even FSD 12, they still struggle to find example cases for very extreme edge cases. Humans, what one of the big differences with, between humans when we're driving and FSD is FSD has been trained on driving, which obviously makes sense. But a human has a big advantage that they've had a lot of training when they were a child at home. They've learned about all sorts of things that happen in the world. So when something strange, that, or at least strange with regard to a road, and it shouldn't be on the road appears, and there's been no training examples, what do you do? A human will know, ah, that's a child in a, doing something strange. Whereas the human, the, the, the FSD might never have seen that. Well, sure. funny we should say that, but Tesla is going to have millions of robots in people's homes learning about all that context. How would Apple get that bit? Indeed. The, the, answer, the answer remains, they just couldn't. And yeah. in terms of humans being trained from birth, if you've ever watched a busy intersection when it goes to all way cross and everyone is going in a different direction, we don't run into each other. When we do, it's so rare we say something. Uh, whether it's, hey, buddy, watch where you're going, or sorry about that. But mm. the, these are things that bots would require extensive training on. And yeah, just recognizing the difference, a, a real challenge in early uh, autonomy was uh, animal versus garbage bag. Yes. And humans can struggle with that too. But the uh, determination we make is much quicker than it took me to find the word determination. So in in the comments, what I'd like to know is where on earth would a non-automotive company 
Bosch, I mean, Bosch is a, an auto auto supplier, but they're not, they don't make cars. Bosch or uh, Delphi or any of those, anybody who doesn't, or Apple, anybody who doesn't make cars, where, oh, where would my little data be? Where could they find it? That's what I want to know. Hit them in the comments below. Uh, John is, is considering coming back on the show, but what we need to do is in the comments. Tell us, uh, did you find his insights insightful? and useful and helpful and all that good stuff. Hey, uh, guys, subscribe. Would you do me a favor? Would you, could you? Pretty please and thanks. If everybody watching the video subscribed, I'd already be over 100,000. And then I would maybe start to get some respect. Although I said that when I was coming up on 20 and 50,000. And to this day, no one in their right mind has bothered to respect me because, you know, they know better. I know what I did. So uh, like, subscribe, do the usual things. Everybody else, stay tuned, stay juicy, and I cannot wait to hear from you clever robots in a world where data is actually available to Apple, I guess. Thank you, Brian. Reminder to keep uh, as much eye on the camera as possible. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, oh, the camera's moved. <laughs> oh, we're on camera too. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. <laughs>